which we are three days out from the start of the 2024 race in Iowa. We're seeing the candidates talk taxes, abortion, and some late-breaking criticism of Donald Trump. Let's cut taxes on the middle class and simplify those brackets. Donald Trump's running for his issues. Uh, Haley's running on the donors' issues. I'm running on your issues. Ron doesn't defeat Biden. Trump is head-to-head -head with Biden. Monday matters. Your voice matters. I trust you. I think there's two America First candidates in this race, Donald Trump and myself. Donald Trump was president for four years. He did not make a dent in the administrative state. I know why you're excited. No more commercials after four days. Haley referring to the multi-multi-million dollar onslaught of ads that's been greeting Iowans. She made a joke. DeSantis has become a joke. Don't believe a thing Nikki Haley says. Ron DeSantis, losing and lying. Haley even opposed Trump's wall. Haley disparages the caucuses and insults you. Now, the intense wrangling between those two candidates reflects a bet about this Republican electorate. The bet is that supporters of former President Trump are pretty decided. But any anti-Trump vote is more up for grabs. With new dynamics, as Governor Christie dropped out this week, and the party's anti-Trump wing, which does exist, is eyeing now Haley as a possible alternative to Trump that they could rally around. There are reports of the ever-ephemeral momentum going her way. There is a hope that a strong Iowa finish for her could propel her in the next several states and at least pause or slow this narrative or reality of the GOP treating Trump as a kind of an heir apparent before he's been actually tested in actual voting races around the country, which is what a primary is supposed to be. The anti-Trump Republican elites also are trying to avoid the very obvious sort of game theory style mistakes of 2016, where the splintered field meant there was never a chance for a single Trump alternative to emerge. Now, Iowa is full of traditions. But this year is a little different for a reason we've actually flagged for you in our coverage just earlier this week, and which is now getting a lot more attention and can't really be avoided if you have any experience in Iowa, meaning you live there or you're you're following scenes like this. The climate change era's extreme weather is going to take a bite out of the traditions this year. Iowans bracing for negative 20 temperatures Monday. It will be, they say, the coldest Iowa caucus ever in 50 years of doing these things. Candidates already canceling events today as the snow is falling. I know it's going to be cold. Uh, I know it's going to be um, um, not the most pleasant. We don't know what the turnout's going to be. It could be much smaller than what it's been in, you know, in the 16th cycle. We're asking you to caucus for us and bring as many people that you can. Bring who you can. It is slippery when icy. So it's going to be colder than ever. And it will be a race with a former president running. That's something that Republicans have not seen much since the days when Republican Teddy Roosevelt, after the White House, ran against his party on a third party ticket. You remember that? If you're keeping track at home, free beat pens and beat lighters for anyone who can remember the name of that party. I mean, I don't know how we would authenticate it, but I'll give you a second to guess. He was running in the Bull Moose Party, the Bull Moose Party against his fellow Republicans. The point is, you have to go back a long ways to find former presidents running for office. A former president of any kind will bring more fame and stature than other candidates. That can help them. It can also lead to a kind of a distorted polling because the Republican electorate is going to remember the former president more than any of the new options. And as I mentioned, if some of them do well enough, that dynamic could change. But we are a long way from Trump's first Republican campaign when he came down the escalator in the headquarters of a company now found to be a fraud. He's facing hundreds of millions in potential fines. About 6,000 times the average American salary is what Trump or could be fined in a matter of weeks. And this time, Trump is more angry, more defiant, more experienced, and more indicted than his first race. This defendant slash candidate spent the bulk of the last four days in this Iowa homestretch, not on the campaign trail, not in the early states. No, he was in court. And those court hearings were not exactly dry, uneventful, or boring. They broke through with headlines, and we mentioned this in our coverage, but as we wrap the week, I want to emphasize this. They broke through with headlines so bad 
even by the standards of Republican politics and MAGA and Fox News these days. Headlines so bad that Trump had to spin away or lie about them in his big Fox town hall this week. And that was capping a very rough stretch by any measure because most Americans oppose political assassinations and legal claims that their leaders should hypothetically or otherwise have a license to kill Americans. Could a president who ordered SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival who was not impeached he be subject to criminal prosecution. Extraordinary legal arguments, and the judges really push the lawyers to see how far these positions go. Can a president get away with murder? That question and the chilling answer got in court. He would have to be and would speedily be, you know, uh, uh, impeached and convicted before the criminal but prosecution. He, he could get SEAL Team 6 to assassinate somebody for him. The president could take a page from Vladimir Putin's playbook by using the U.S. military like a squad of hitmen. The chilling thing is that's not just a bumbling attorney. That's what Donald Trump believes. If he were impeached and convicted first. And so, so your answer is, is no. Is, my answer is qualified, yes. That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, we need to use some common sense here. You can't go and kill a political rival. In the authoritarian future that he's clamoring for, he gets to do anything he wants, wielding unparalleled power in the presidency and zero repercussions. That's not a president, that's a dictator. His lawyer went much further claiming that as president, <laughs> no, no, it's ridiculous. As, as president, he pretty much has free reign to do whatever he wants. Wow. And as we deal with these situations as a country, there can be nervous laughter, there can be denial to tune it out, but if we've learned anything from history, including the last six years, ignore and laugh it off at your peril. The question here becomes, were we listening to a closing argument for this Iowa home stretch, or a nod towards the arguments for closing down American democracy? and replacing it with a system where presidents steal elections and kill with impunity, and then pardon America's convicted seditionist traitors, and then, when the outcry comes, well, the leaders, lawyers, and hacks will say, that's old news. We told you the plans. The people voted him in. They voted for this. And I said lawyers and hacks because there are some people serving as lawyers for the president. And every person in this country, defendant or not, criminal defendant or not, is entitled to counsel and zealous advocacy, including Donald Trump. And that's what lawyers are supposed to do. The hack you just heard, who dishonored himself as a lawyer, wasn't doing legal advocacy, and he wasn't saying anything that any honest legal expert would describe as advocacy that would help his side win. He was actually saying things antithetical to the known law, contradicting what Trump's lawyers had said in the impeachment process and elsewhere, because as a hack, he wasn't really practicing law this week. He was trying to please Donald Trump and throw red meat to the base and live in the outside courtroom arguments about who's tough and who's autocratic and who can take over and who can kill. So I understand the instinct to look away or give it time or even laugh it off. These are all types of coping mechanisms. But we're not just in a home stretch of 2024's Iowa race coming Monday. We are in a pitched battle over the future of American democracy laid against all of the normal vicissitudes, weather and otherwise, of campaign season.